today we're going to talk about the seven ways to write like a native speaker. Um, most students have to write in English and it's good to have some tips on how to make it sound natural and more idiomatic like the writing of a native speaker. My name is Kirsten Gackel. I grew up in Seattle, Washington and um, I translate and teach translating and writing courses at Leipzig University. So the plan for today are these seven tips right here and we'll come back to them at the end so you can review um, what you've learned. So the first tip to write like a native speaker is to write like you speak. So use verbal constructions, use a lot of verbs. In German, um, German written texts use nouns, tons of nouns. We call German texts TTTs, terrible Teutonic texts. And the written language is a lot different than the spoken language. They're quite a far distance apart. Whereas in English, written English and spoken English are closer together. And in both written and spoken English, then we prefer verbs. So here's an example of a German sentence. Die Stiftung konzentriert sich auf die Förderung der Demokratie und die Entwicklung der Sozialleistungen. You can see lots of big nouns there. If we were to translate the sentence straight into English, we would also get a lot of big nouns. The foundation is dedicated to the promotion of democracy and the development of social services. Well, when you're writing, you might not be translating, but you're still translating the structures that you have in your head from your native language, whether that be German or another language, into English. And so this is, is a helpful tip. We can change these big nouns here into um, verbs here. So we change promotion of to promoting, and development of to developing. And now we end with, the foundation is to de dedicated to promoting democracy and developing social services. This brings down the word count and makes it more idiomatic. It sounds just more natural and more like the writing of a native speaker. Tip number two, focus on the subject verb object. So you can imagine the subject and verb in a sentence like the engines that pull a train. So as long as you have the subject and, for, and verb in the, at the beginning, the verb shouldn't be any further back than the third position, and it's usually in the second position, then actually you can pull along a pretty complex sentence in English. It's, it's not that sentences have to be simple, it's just that you need to get the subject and verb at the front. And then in many languages, you get elements, you get things between the subject and verb or between the verb and the object. And um, these are what we call disturbing middle elements. So when you're going through your writing, you can analyze it. And if there's anything between the subject and verb or between the verb and the object, you should move it, either move it to the front or move it to the back. And then you'll be able to retain the subject verb object construction and it will sound more natural. Um, we also want to use active subjects. Uh, many, we, Lanham said, we need to know who's kicking whom in English. So you want to have the person right up there in the subject or at least the thing up in the subject. You wouldn't want to start with something abstract. This is a really nice um, sample sentence. In German, we have ein Wald von herrlichen Buchen nahm ihn auf. Well, if we were to translate it directly, it would be a forest of magnificent beech trees took him up. And you see the person is hidden here at the end, in him. But the standard translation for the sentence is actually, he entered a forest of magnificent beech trees. And there you can see the subject and the verb right up at the front, providing the structure for the entire sentence. So tip number two, don't forget the subject verb object. Tip number three is put the most important information at the end. And we have a sample sentence here from Shakespeare. The queen, my lord, is dead. So the most important information is that someone is dead. The next most important information is who's dead. And the least important information is who the speaker's talking to in the middle three. So 
English teachers call these two, three, one sentences. And that's what you should be aiming for in your writing, is to get the most important information at the end. If we take um, an additional sentence, did you hear about the queen? Well, here, the new information is the queen. That's the most important information. And also the new information. And we take this to start our next sentence. The queen, my lord, is dead. So what we end up with is an old to new information flow. And in English, you've got to have this flow of information from old to new in order for your text to glue together and flow like a text. Otherwise, it'll just be like sentences kind of lined up in a row next to each other, but yet um, not flowing. So to make your text sound natural, you want to use the old to new information flow. Adverbs, you also want to put them in the middle because they're not usually the, the most important or the new information, and that's why they don't go at the end. Okay, tip number four, avoid German words or other words from your native language that um, might be similar. So in German, it's very popular to start academic German sentences with these words here. Aufgrund, besonders, nur, nicht nur, und auch. And a lot of German speakers, when they're writing in English, then use the same words to start their English sentences. Due to, especially, only, not only, and also. But if you do that, it's going to sound kind of danglish like, uh, and not like a natural a text written by a native speaker. So we have a, uh, um, an example here. Only when a question was answered correctly, I confirmed their choice. This is from a student who came to the language clinic who was um, studying to become a teacher. And I suggested, why don't we put a subject verb in front instead? Then we have, it was only when a question was answered correctly that I confirmed their choice. And then we decided together to go one step further and to put the active subject, the who, who is kicking whom, right up at the front. I only confirmed their choice when a question was answered correctly. So there we've got the subject verb object and um, the active person right at the front and it flows a little bit more nicely. There's some other German words that you might want to avoid no matter where they appear, at the beginning, middle, or end of your sentence. Some of these include due to, different, more and more, nowadays, and among others. They have a very high frequency in German, but a low frequency in academic writing, as we can see from this graph, which comes from the Macmillan Dictionary. Here you can see that in academic writing, due to has a very low frequency. You could start your sentence with something else, like given or sense. If you're interested in more of these Germanisms, um, this is a very nice blog called False Friends, Good and Bad Translation that you might be interested in. Tip number five, edit out words that are too informal for academic writing. Examples of these are connectors, like so and besides. And here in the graph, again, we see that Besides, is very low frequency in academic writing. And the reason that you want to have constructions that are high frequency is because if you take a high frequency structure, then it's going to sound more natural and it will sound like the text is written by a native speaker. Other connectors that are too informal in some fields are and and but at the beginning of a sentence. The second category is phrasal verbs. And I've just written some examples here. Figure out, determine, instead of look into, investigate, instead of put up with, tolerate, instead of come up with, develop. And it just sounds a little more academic to edit out the more informal phrasal verbs here. The third category are individual words. And I was an um, examiner for state exams in Bavaria for three years and kept a list of words that came up um, quite often in, in student writing and of words that were simply too informal for academic writing. So on the left, you see a list of several individual words that are too informal. And on the right 
are other alternatives that you could use to make your writing sound more natural and more academic. Tip number six. Again, um, we want to use frequent construction. So we want to use common academic phrasing. And here, a great way, place to go is the Manchester Academic Phrase Bank. There are phrases for all sorts of general functions as well as for each section of the research paper. And as long as the information that you put in the blank is your own, then it's not plagiarism because these phrases have been used tens of thousands of millions of times. Uh, a similar phrase bank or bank of phrases like these comes from They Say, I Say, a book that is required reading at over half of the universities in the United States in English courses. And then the third is to collect phrases from the academic papers that you're reading. So you might consider um, making an electronic file, like an Excel file, and saving the, the phrases that you find to be quite useful or fancy or eloquent. Okay, and then tip number seven, our last tip, is to use customized Google searches. So you probably heard this, the thesaurus is not always your friend. If you go and look in the thesaurus or in a dictionary like Lingue, Dict.leo, or machine translation like DeepL or Google Translate, that's just the first step. You need to verify that what you found is actually used on monolingual websites, is used by people in your field. So what I suggest um, is that you do a Google search where you put the term or the phrase into quotation marks, and then you search site colon edu. And this will search all of the American universities or you could try site colon ac.uk, which will search all of the British universities. If your term or phrase comes up, especially if you add a keyword like your field, psychology, whatever it might be, comes up 1,000 times, even 500 times, and they're all on reputable um, websites from universities in those countries, then you can be pretty sure that that's the right term or that's a phrase that's used in your context. If it only comes up a few times and you look at the website sites and you realize, oh, those are some German websites or other websites from other countries that kind of snuck in, then you need to go back to step one and look for a new alternative in those dictionaries and um, machine translation. And the last thing you can do on these customized Google searches is you can put an asterisk in a collocation if you're like just looking for that perfect word and you can't find it. And here we have the example. In recent years, there has been asterisk interest in. When you do that, you'll get lots of possibilities like significant interest, much interest, increased interest. Then you can choose one you like, Google it um, for the frequency, and then decide on which you like to use that way. Our bonus tip is to use a dictionary and a style guide. For American English, most writers and editors use Merriam-Webster, have the website right here, and for British English, um, Oxford. You can use another variant, for example, Canadian English or Australian English if you did a study abroad, but you need to have a dictionary where you can look up the spelling and the definition and the hyphenation for the words that, that um, come into question. And then you also need to have a style guide. Uh, common style guides include MLA, APA, Chicago Manual of Style, and Oxford Style Manual. If you're not sure which style guide to use, the first step is to ask your instructor or supervisor. Um, the second step is to look at this citation chart, which gives a good overview of the main style guides. And the third step would be consult this overview of style guides used in the different disciplines, so the different fields. So to review, these are the seven tips that we looked at. Um, when you, ways to write like a native speaker, write like you speak, uh, focus on that subject verb object, put the important information at the end, a 
avoid German words, edit out words that are too informal for academic writing, use common, frequent academic phrases, use customized Google searches, and make sure you have a dictionary and a style guide next to you that you can refer to when you have questions. Thanks so much for your attention.